Okay, so hello everybody. Sorry we're a few minutes late. Um, um, I'm just gonna, I'll open the planning board meeting for uh, Wednesday, September 2nd, uh, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. now that we have quorum. Um, I'm gonna read in a letter pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 38, section 18 of the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. The meeting of the Bridgewater Planning Board will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. This meeting is being recorded and within 48 hours, we will post a link of the recording on the town's website and or the town's social media page. The following members of the Bridgewater Planning Board are participating remotely. Patrick Driscoll, which is uh, me, I'm the chair. Raymond DeJamie, I'm the vice chair. Gene Garino, the clerk. Michael McDonald and Stephen Geller. Um, I just want to let everybody know that Mr. Geller was not at our last meeting. Um, pursuant to the Mullen rule, he did watch the recording of the last meeting and will be voting if we decide to vote uh, tonight uh, on, this, on this project. He, he's up to speed and, and, and has signed and filed the certification. Um, and that's due because it's a, that's due in part because it's a, a special permit. Uh, during this meeting, all votes of the board will be taken uh, via roll calls. Um, the following Bridgewater Town uh, staff will be uh, participating remotely. Also, Jennifer Burke, who is our Community and Economic Development Director. Eliza Romulus, who's our Assistant Town Planner. Azu Antonero, who is um, the Town Engineer. Uh, Leslie Dorr, who is the office administrator. Um, Azu will be joining us in about 15 to 20 minutes. He's, he's not on the, um, the, the Zoom meeting currently. At this point, everybody's mute is uh, At this point, everybody's mic is muted. The board's mics will be unmuted through the whole meeting. And as the items appear on the agenda, the project's representative's mics will be unmuted. If the project is a public hearing and allows a public comment, we ask that you use the chat feature to ask your question by listing your name and address and your question. The chair will recognize all questions in order. You can also use the raise my hand feature in the participant menu and you'll be unmuted when the chair recognizes you. Again, please state your name and address for the record before asking a question. We ask that you keep your questions or your testimony to uh, three minutes or less. If you are on the phone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. <clears throat> um, as I had stated, we. We were, we are waiting for the town engineer uh, who will join us about 6.50. Um, in the meantime, we thought it would be a good, good time. We did receive um, nine letters, both in support and opposition to the project or, or both in support or concerns to the project. We thought we'd read those into the record. We also did receive um, some site plan comments from our town engineer, Mr. Antonero. We'll read those into the record and we received a response letter from Silver Engineering. So. Um, we just ask that we're going to read everybody's letter into the record. Um, just for everybody's sake and time, we just ask that those, questions, those letters not be repeated uh, by the same person um, so we can move the, the meeting along. Um, so with that being said, we'll open the public hearing for um, Lot 84 Fruit Street, which is also known as Zero Pleasant Street. This is being proposed by Claremont Bridgewater LLC which is a special permit and a site plan. The proposal is for an, an office warehouse building uh, and for distribution with, with a parking lot and associated parking, map 83, lot, lot 84. So um, what we've decided to do is a couple of the board members and, and our director, uh, Ms. Burke, are gonna read the um, nine letters into the record um, that we have received uh, beginning on August 17th all the way through today. And then I will read the um, uh, correspondence we received from the town engineer. So um, who's up first on the planning board? Want me to start? Sure. Uh, okay. An email from David Morgan dated today, Wednesday, September 2nd. Regarding uh, support for the Flex Building near Lakeshore Center. Bridgewater Planning Board, over the years, the Claremont companies have had a positive impact on the community 
through the jobs and tax revenue their projects have provided. Specifically, they've attracted major employers such as Abella Insurance, Bank of America, Guardian Life Insurance, Mass Ioneer, and New York Life. In addition, they are presently the largest source of the town's commercial tax revenue. Now they are proposing a flex building near Lakeshore Center to attract high tech and life science companies to the area. This will allow the Claremont companies to potentially bring some of the global leaders in these industries to our com community, such as Siemens and Medtronic, mm. which are tenants in similar types of properties. As a result, I know that many residents would welcome the opportunity that this project would provide. I hope that you recognize the value of this proposal as well. David Morgan from 243 Curve Street in Bridgewater. And then, um, Next one is from um, Gary Abrams on, and his was dated September 1st. I am writing in opposition to the proposed warehouse office space on Fruit Street, Zero Pleasant Street. My main concern is traffic and the ability for such a small area to handle large tractor trailers entering and exiting. It is directly across from Lakeside Drive and also the on-off ramp to Route 24. This area is already very congested and there simply is not enough room on the road to accommodate the increased flow of cars and trucks. This is definitely a safety concern as well as a huge inconvenience to the homeowners on Lakeside Drive as well as other roads that are directly off Route 104. If any of you that are voting have taken the time to observe what Route 104 from the 24 overpass to the Rainham line is like in the early morning or at afternoon rush hour, you would realize that this is a bad idea. With the existing apartments, the hotel, the two office buildings, and the new apartment construction, which will add another 300 cars per day to the road, it's simple math to see there is a potential for disaster. You must take into consideration the well-being of the adjacent residents that have already taken on the burden of increased traffic in the name of increasing the town's tax base. Also, the wildlife that are living in the Lake Nipponicket area have already been displaced to the point of extinction. Well, let's not forget how much of the wetlands this landowner has taken away. Please do not approve this proposal. Thank you, Gary Abrams of 90 Goodwater Way. And then dated August 17th from Janet Hansen, 655 Pleasant Street in Bridgewater to the Town of Bridgewater Planning Board. I am writing this letter to express some concerns and questions I have with the Claremont Bridgewater LLC proposed office warehouse building, the distribution with a parking lot and associated parking, map 83, lot 84 on Fruit Street in Bridgewater. <clears throat> I tried to locate their proposal plans, but could not, so I am limited on what I can accurately comment on, but can ask questions. As we all know, this area is still considered to be part of the Hockamock Swamp, and wetlands on that property are of a concern. I would hope that they are being protected to the fullest extent of the law. Lot 84 on map 83 abuts lot 85, also known as lot seven, and lot 19, also known as lot six, which are historical sites along with protected area for the Eastern box turtle. My concerns are for the protection of those lots and how the proposed building on lot 84 could affect those sites and the endangered turtle along with other wildlife and wetlands. 
I have been looking at the 10-12-2018 Certificate of the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs on the Draft Supplemental Environmental Impact Report, which looks at the Claremont's proposed use of the entire property. Included with that are letters from the State Historic Preservation Officer, Rona Simon, pages 17 to 18, and David Paulson's Senior Endangered Species Review, Biologist, Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, pages 19 to 20, among others. In these letters, it discusses the archeological areas and the endangered species. Lots five, six, seven, and eight are of concern and even if they are not on lot 84, they still have bought lot 84. So there are potential concerns. The report is lengthy, but worth reading and reviewing to be sure all the recommendations have been met. I am not sure if rules or regulations have changed since this study was done, but I hope that all protections will be in place to protect the area. I have attached a copy of the report. There is a specific paragraph titled Historic Resources, see page seven to eight, which discusses protecting the historical sites. Have those measures been put in place as recommended in the report? Land alteration, page 11. Have they identified open space that will remain untouched? Have they designated a preservation restriction on appropriate areas? Sea rare species, page 12. Lots six and seven meet the National Register of Historic Places of criteria for evaluation. Has that area been designated to be protected and not built on? How does nearby construction affect those areas? What is in place to protect them? How far away is the building and the parking lots from the boundary lines between the lots? Mm -hmm. Vegetation needs to be protected and left alone, not to be cut down, to then be replaced. Mm -hmm. It should be left undisturbed. What protections will be in place? I'm sure you will be looking at water supplies, drainage, lights, pollution, noise, etc. Also, I am not sure if the traffic study is still valid. Has that been revisited? I would pray that any upgrades or changes to the roadways would not have any negative impact on the NIP and surrounding areas. So in conclusion, I will be looking closely at how they plan on preserving the rest of their property and what the impact of the warehouse will be on that area and the surrounding critical land. I'm also interested in if they have identified open space that is supposed to remain undisturbed. Has anyone followed that? If there is a new report that is different from the attached one, please direct me to it so I can be correctly informed. Thank you for your time and look forward to a thoughtful and thorough discussion regarding the proposed warehouse. Sincerely, Janet Hansen. Ms. Burke, Ms. Burke, are you up next? Sure. I have a letter here from Jonathan and Denise Bigat, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, dated September 1st, 2020. Dear members of the Bridgewater Planning Board, we live at 245 Lakeside Drive and have been residents of Bridgewater for the past 30 years. We have watched our town grow and become what is now a city. We have been Mr. Carney's neighbors ever since he proposed an industrial park like Paramount Drive in Rainham back in the early 1990s. We do support managed commercial growth in the town in terms of tax revenues and job creation and want to ensure that our town governance is keeping an eye towards balancing the pros and cons of development and how it impacts the neighboring residents. 
Over the past 20 years, we have watched the Claremont property progress from a single three-story office building to the addition of a 289-unit apartment complex, followed by a four-story, 103-room hotel building, then a second four-story office building, and the most recent addition in progress, a 300 apartment complex, Viva. For each successive development, the height and scope of the buildings increases. While Claremont Corporation continues to invest in Bridgewater, it also heaps the, reaps the benefits of working with the town to develop these large parcels, which also add to the costs, add to the cost to the town in overall town services. Claremont now proposes to build and implement another new development project, which calls for 103,000 square foot mixed use flexible space with dock doors, etc. That will bring even more traffic to this area. They have also recently proposed and have withdrawn, we believe, a restaurant on the shores of Lake Nipponicket, further encroaching on the wetlands buffer and further increasing traffic to the area. We are interested in better understanding the DOT requirements for traffic studies, as we believe it warrants a full model and analysis of all the traffic that sur the surrounding neighborhoods will be dealing with once all these developments are fully occupied and operational. With all due respect, we are not sure whether the board realizes that there is a stark contrast between Route 104 and Lakeside Drive and the residential developments that surround it. The residents of Lake, Lake Nipponicket neighborhood appreciate the beauty of the area we live in and realize that our new neighbors from the Claremont properties do as well, which has resulted in an increase in all forms of neighborhood traffic, walkers, runners, bicyclists, skateboarders, and more. This makes the issue of safety even more important in this area. Please take the traffic and safety concerns addressed above into consideration in making your in your decision making process on this issue. Sincerely, Jonathan and Denise Gagat, 245 Lakeside Drive, Bridgewater, Mass. And I have an email from Nancy Abrams dated Monday, August 31st, 2020. Dear Planning Board, I'm writing to you in regards to the Lot 84 Fruit Street proposal. I have many concerns about this proposal from destroying the wildlife's home to creating major backups on Route 104. I wonder how many more acres of land this town is going to allow Claremont companies to destroy. They have already taken away precious homes from wildlife. Please do not allow them to continue this destruction of the environment. The traffic is also a major concern for me. I can now see the off ramps of Route 24 at 104 being backed up as tractor trailers are entering 104 to go to the proposed warehouse. 104 has already become quite busy with the condos that the Claremont companies have built. Now add tractor trailers to that congestion, not only on the off ramps, but on 104 itself. Imagine yourself living on one side of, on the side roads off of 104 and trying to pull out onto 104 with cars and tractor trailers zipping by. Nightmare and dangerous. I can hear the sirens now responding to numerous accidents. Please take this into consideration along with all the other con concerns residents of this town have. Thank you for your time and consideration. Nancy Abrams, 90 Goodwater Way, Bridgewater. And I have a letter from Peter Smith dated August 17th. To whom it may concern. I believe that Bridgewater is a great place to live for several reasons. It is a picturesque community with a vibrant downtown, school, and a state university. However, maintaining the character of our community would not be possible without proper planning. For example, the business park developed by the Claremont companies is based on principles of smart growth. Located near the highway, this business park has become a primary source of the town's economic development. It has attracted ma major employers to complement our local businesses while providing significant jobs and tax revenues for our community. Now the Claremont Companies has proposed another project to further diversity our local economy by attracting high tech and life science companies. Given their track record of success, I am sure that this project would be another asset to the town. Therefore, I respectfully request that you approve this proposal. Sincerely, Pete Smith, 75 Greenbrier Lane, Bridgewater, Mass. Ready, you next. Thanks, Barack. You're all set. Okay. 
right. Um, just uh, as a way of uh, introduction, I just want to make one comment. That is that as much as the people that have written these letters are giving their opinion to the board, it's the their comments and their research is invaluable to the board in terms of uh, making a decision. It's some, at least in my case, um, some issues have been brought up that I would never have thought of before. That said, the first letter that I have is from the Tawn River Watershed Alliance. It's dated August 25th, addressed to the Bridgewater Planning Board. Dear Mr. Uh, Driscoll et al., the Tawn River Watershed Alliance would like to provide comments on behalf of the watershed on proposed flex building development off of Fruit Street currently before the board. The TRWA does not oppose development, however, at a, law, at a loss to why a planned development district was so designated in such a sensitive area that includes a zone two aquifer for the town of Raynham Wells, the Hockamock Swamp area of critical concern, ACEC, and Lake Nepanicket. For 32 years, TRWA has been a voice for the 562 square mile Taunton River watershed, an advocate for environmental protection, sustainability development, sustainable development, and responsible stewardship of our precious water resources. We are an alliance of concerned residents, businesses, and organizations united to restore properly managed water and related natural resources within the Taunton River watershed. Our mission is to provide and restore the watershed's natural resources for current and future generations, build and support reasonable stewardship of fragile ecosystems, water quality, forest, farmland, and wetlands, provide opportunities for people to enjoy the river and the watershed's open space to be an integral resource for environmental education and be voiced for threat, excuse me, for threatened land and water resources. TRWA, as stated before, doesn't oppose development, especially development in suitable areas, however, has serious concerns on the effect of this project will have on the aquifer and of the Lake Nipponicket resource area. The building itself will cover 103,000 square feet, not to mention the parking lot created a, creating a large amount of an impermeable surface over the aquifer, which requires permeable surface for recharge. Massachusetts is currently in a severe drought and we are concerned what the effect of this impermeable surface would do to the recharge of the lake as well as the aquifer. In this area, in, in this area that has been con confusingly designated a priority development district with only 25 feet of buffer to wetlands, we strongly excuse me, we strongly encourage the use of sustainable practices such as permeable pavement and sustainable drainage. If you have any questions, please don't <coughs> excuse me. Estate to count to God take me. <coughs> excuse me. And signed by Phyllis uh, Chapman, president of the TR. WA, sorry for the coughing, I just had some nuts. <clears throat> a second letter dated uh, September 2nd, it's addressed to the, uh, the uh, Conservation Commissioner of Bridgewater, but the CC to the Bridgewater Planning Board, it's, it's signed by a Andrea Monti from Lakeside Drive. Dear Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to comment. As you are aware, the proposed project, Notice of Intent off Fruit Street, Map 83, Lot 84, it's located in the Hockamock Swamp area of critical environmental concern and the upland areas about extensive wetlands that are hydraulically connected to Lake Nipponicket, the headwaters for the Talon River, which flows into the Taunton River. As stated on the Massachusetts ACEC program website, quote, an area of critical environmental concern, ACEC, is a place in Massachusetts that receives special recognition because of the quality, uniqueness, and significance of the natural and cultural resources. Such an area is identified and nominated at, at the community level and is reviewed and designated by the State Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, unquote. The ACEC designation recognizes significant ecosystems and is intended to foster appreciation stewardship of the unique natural and cultural resources in the area. Uh, ultimately, a designation provides a framework for citizens, communities, and agencies to work together and ensure the long preservation management of these areas, unquote. The Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act, General Laws Chapter 131, Paragraph 40, the act was enacted to pr protect wetlands, floodplains, and riverfront areas from uh, destruction and all alteration. Work in the 100-foot buffer to the wetlands can potentially have an impact on the adjo adjacent, adjoining wetlands and are therefore subject to regulation 
under the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act. As you know, the Conservation Commission may impose conditions or limits on activity done in a buffer zone that the nearby wetland is protected. The proposed project site was previously identified by the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife's National Heritage and Endangered Species Program as priority in established habitat for the eastern bottle box turtle and yellow spotted turtle. Along the yellow spotted turtles were removed, although the yellow spotted turtles were removed from the endangered species list in 2006, development and construction alters the wetland and upland habitats that the yellow spotted turtle rely on. According to the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, NHESP March uh, 2018 article, Monitor, uh, quote, monitoring and, and properly managing spotted turtle population in southeastern Massachusetts is important to the long-term persistence of the species throughout the region, unquote. Although the proponent has negotiated a financial agreement with NHESP to provide a quote unquote net benefit offsite to meet performance standards, it is still imperative that at least the 100 foot buffer to the wetlands is protected to not only reduce any impact to the wet, wetlands, but also to ensure that the yellow spotted turtle populations have both the wetlands and upland habitat they need to, in order to survive. It is my understanding that the, project, the proposed project to avoid dis, uh, disturbance of the 25 no touch buffer for the town of Bridgewater wetland bylaw. However, given that the project site is part of the sensitive Hockamock Swamp area of critical environmental concern, the commission should strongly consider the negative effect that any type of work in the wetland buffer zone including stormwater management detention systems will have on the extensive wetlands on the site and our hydrological uh, connection to Lake Nipponicket and the headwaters of Town River. The proposed project is also located on, the, on an aquifer for the town of Raynham. According to the recent EPA report on groundwater, there are many stressors that affect groundwater conditions. In reference to the proposed developments of, of the site, one such stressor that it concerns me is that is the application of pesticides and fertilizers to the land that can ultimately affect the quality of drinking water. In addition, as you know, oil and gas spills, including chemical spills or leaks, affect groundwater conditions. These are major stressors and can affect the quality of drinking water for rain and residents. Furthermore, many fish species in Lake Nibinicket depend on the spring-fed water from the aquifer for habitat and spawning. Another concern is that impervious paved surface proposed for this project may prevent precipitation from recharging the groundwater, which could potentially take thousands of years to replenish. One consequence of in insufficient recharge of the aquifer is lowering lower lake levels that can harm aqua aqua aquatic plants and animals that depend on regular surface flows. In reference to the proposed stormwater management systems, I strongly encourage proponents to consider low impact development, LID uh, systems, and practices that mimic natural process to protect water and quality associated habitat. According to the EPA, quote unquote, LID, LID import, em, employs principles such as preserving uh, re, and recreating natural landscapes features, minimizing effect impervious to effective, in, effective imperviousness to create function and appealing site drainage that treats stormwaters as a resource rather than as a waste product, unquote. The LID system would provide valuable habitat to the considerable wildlife on site. In summary, I'm, I'm, I'm respectfully asking the commission to take the consideration of this proposed project site is located in a highly sensitive area of critical environmental concern with extensive wetlands that are hydraulically connected to Lake Nipponicket. This is, is habitat to extensive wildlife, including the eastern box turtle and yellow spotted turtle and is located on an aquifer for the town of Radium. For all these reasons, I'm asking the commission to strongly consider not allowing any alteration to the underfoot buffer to the wetlands and ask that proponent investigate LID systems to address strong stormwater management of the site. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to comment and for your consideration. Concerns with kindly regards, Andrea Monteith, uh, which is uh, 255 Lakeside Drive. Last one. This is um, addressed to September, the state of September 2nd, addressed to Patrick Driscoll, the uh, chair of the town planning board, and it's from Melissa Romandetta on 317 Lakeside Drive. Dear members of the planning board, 
Thanks for the opportunity to comment on the proposed development off Fruit Street, Map 83, Lot 84, an office and warehouse building with parking and associated grading within the buffer zone to a bordering vegetated wetland. Although the project is being proposed to the planning board as a single entity, it is part of a large scale alteration of land designated under area of critical environmental concern, ACEC, and bordering Lake Nipponicket and the Huckamock Swamp and its associate wetlands. Quote, designation of an ACEC increases environmental oversight by increasing state permitting standards through elevated performance standards and lower thresholds for review, unquote. This proposed project represents the last portion of phase, phase three of a four phase development plan by Claremont Companies impacting 154.19 acres in Bridgewater. The final supplementary environmental impact report, FSEIR, certification dated tw December 28, 2018, EEA number 4959 attached, states, quote, potential environmental impacts associated with phase three include 19.7 acres of new impervious surface, generation of additional 3,216 3, ADT, the addition of 1,148 new parking spaces and increases in water use and waste, wastewater generation by six, 63,333 gallons, unquote. According to the site data from the site plan provided by the applicant, parcel related to this proposal is 24.8 acres consisting of 11.7 acres of uplands and 13.1 acres of wetlands. The building and parking area creates 6.45 acres of impervious surface with an additional 1.67 acres of drainage functionality. The proponent lists, quote, other open areas, unquote, as composing 2.68 acres. However, it does not identify how these 2.68 acres will be developed. Will the other, other, other open areas remain in a natural condition? To avoid tree clearing within the ACEC, applicants should be encouraged to keep the open areas, open other areas in their natural state and avoiding tree clearing. With this in mind, as well as the fact that this project is part of a large four phase development with, with an a, within an ACEC, it is crucial that tree cottage tree clearing be minimized on this site to preserve habitat, includes the Eastern Box Turtle, uh, mass special concern and the yellow spotted turtle. Also, as noted on this site walk last week, the site borders Route 24. The highway noise is significant and will be only magnified by significant tree clearing. It's apparent from the site plan provided, including the landscaping plan, that the entire upland site and a portion of the 100 foot buffer area to the wet clear cut of trees. A large amount of grass and minimal ordinance Ornament trees will be or, ornamental trees will be planted along the property in this plate in its place. The applicant has opted to completely build out this site with no plan to maintain upland areas in their natural state. Efforts to minimize the complete build out of this site to preserve the natural habitat and provide a sound buffer are necessary. Even this includes the reduction in size proposed project. The applicant has requested permission to alter the 100 foot buffer to wetlands. This alteration includes the majority of drainage basin one and sediment four bay, a portion of the driveway slash paved parking lot, loading docks, six tractor trailer parking space, and a portion of the building. It is crucial that the 100 foot buffer to the wetlands is protected to not only reduce any impact to the wetlands, but also ensure that the turtle populations and other species have both the wetlands and upland habitats needed for survival. The construction within the buffer zone includes six tractor trailer parking spaces and loading docks presents an uncertainty for the future as to possible vehicle slash truck gas oil leaks on the property, as well as truck cargoes containing hazardous chemicals that, that could impact the wetlands. As noted earlier, phase three of the project will add over 3,216 additional vehicle trips per day on Route 104. Although the esti estimate, estimation for this single project is approximately 350 trips per day, the residents of the area have felt significant <laughs> impact from phase one and two, and now will bear the bur bur brunt of phase three. According to the FSEIR, there, there are no traffic mitigations planned by the OT or the town of Bridgewater, with the exception of single changes, single changes on Route 104, as the volume coming from Lakeside Drive is low. The 70 plus households on Lakeside Drive neighborhood, as well as the 20 plus households on Route 24 will be significantly impacted 
by the opening of the business's apartments and now the office warehouse in phase three. Any mitigation efforts that the planning board could propose to reduce impacts would be beneficial. Also the board comments on whether or not a vehicle access permit has been obtained from the mass DOT as noted in FSEIR. The zoning of this area is currently a planned development district according to the town of Bridgewater, Massachusetts zoning bylaws latest revision October 12th, 2018. The purpose of a planned development district, quote, is to allow the town to regulate development of planned industrial parks and designate as suitable areas so as to achieve significant revenue or employment benefits without adverse impacts on the neighborhoods or on the town and natural resources, unquote. The language for the planned development district clearly indicates that permitting is associated with, quote, planned industrial slash commercial part, unquote. Pose project is not within a, quote, planned industrial commercial park, unquote. It's a single standalone flex use building that has access from a public road and does not tie into an industrial slash commercial park in its campus-like setting. The project as proposed does not appear to comply with the SMESH for pinning requirements for the planned development district as noted in the town of Bridgewater zoning bylaws latest revision October 12, 2018. Copy of this letter is being sent to Mr. Stephen Solari, the town of Bridgewater zoning enforcement officer for his information and clarification. Also, Clause 9.652 of the zoning of the town zoning bylaw states the following requirement that raise concern and intention by the planning board. The, the, quote, before approving an application for special permit under this section, the planning board shall find that the pos proposal meets the requirements of the 9.63 and 9.64 above and, and 9.652 that the internal vehicle cir circulation system provides for flex vehicle Vehicle, vehicular circulation connection all points within the park without use of roads and outside the development that, it, that and that it, it avoids use of long dead end roads to provides an alternate emergency bypass route to dead end roads over 1000 in length. 9.654 that based on recommendations of the planning board the project has safe access in, in parentheses in terms of sight lines and grade to existing public ways and that such public way has sufficient capacity in its present state or with plan improvements to accommodate the project at its maximum development. The special permitting process for a plan development districts includes in the review fact following factors, mixture of use slash site access slash internal circulation slash parking slash probable traffic impact slash overall density slash building location slash overall uh, project layout slash provision and design of open space slash visual impact on adjacent ways and neighborhoods slash drainage and water resources impacts. The effect, the, the, the efforts of the planning board to review this application with consideration for sensitivity of the area and the tremendous impact that both this project as well as the entire phase three project will have and has already had on its surrounding areas and neighborhoods is so important the focus of the applicant should be on minimizing impact and improving the community surrounding. However, the site plan as proposed does not indicate that minimization of impact on the surrounding neighborhoods or upland habitat and wetlands is a priority. The special permitting process impacted by this project include the following. Mixture of uses. As tenants have not yet been established, it is not clear what the use of the proposed project will be. Probable traffic impacts, increased traffic, 3,216 additional traffic per day for phase three in an area already impacted by phase one, two, and three, and soon to be phase three. Building location. There are questions with regard to whether the proposed project as a single stand standalone building comp complies with current town zoning bylaws for a planned development district. Overall project layout, drainage and water resource impacts. The proposed, the proposed project impacts the 100-foot buffer zone of a wetland with an area of critical environmental concern. Proposed residents on an aquifer protection for the town of Rutrena. Vision and design of open space. The applicant has built out the entire site. There is no open space. Visual and adjacent ways, visual impact on adjacent ways and neighborhoods. Although the applicant has indicated that the project will not be visible from Route 104, it is likely that in the winter months it will be visible. Also, the increased trailer traffic and, and vehicle traffic will be visible. Kind regards, Messia, uh, excuse me, Melissa Bondetta. That's it. All right, so, um, Mr. 
Antonero, uh, town engineer, has joined us. Um, my plan, Mr. Antonero, was to read your um, re your engineering review. Would you like me to read that, or would you like to to walk through it with us? Or how would, I was going to do that because we didn't know if you were going to be here or not. Would you still like me to read it? Uh, Mr. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, your normal course of our uh, procedures to uh, read all, all correspondences into record. <clears throat> all right. Now, I didn't know if you wanted to go through it and read it yourself. I, I'm happy to do it. So, um, an email received uh, today, September 2nd, 2020, uh, to Mr. Romulus. Uh, this email transmission shall serve to formalize and memorialize, memorialize my technical review findings regarding the proposed development of the 103,000 square foot commercial industrial use building at the above sub subject location. As I have previously indicated verbally, the project plan composed of 11 sheets dated June 24, 2020, in the June 24, 2020 stormwater management report prepared by Silver Engineering Associates, SEA, are generally satisfactory and ref reflect the requisite design elements necessary for a functional site development proposal. My review findings, comments, recommendations at this time include the following. Number one, the proposed water, water supply lines for the site shall not be connected to the existing old water main on Pleasant Street that is constructed of transit pipe material. It should be connected to a new water main. I have communicated this to the water superintendent who is coordinating the site's water impact evaluation by Stantec, the town's engineering consultant for water supply. Unless the complete replacement of the existing transit pipe is contemplated, it should remain undisturbed. Number two, the elevation of the bottom of the stone clusters for the stormwater infiltration in drainage basin number one should be adjusted upward in order to provide a minimum of two feet of separation between the bottom of the stone cl clusters and the groundwater, as the stone clusters are an integral part of the basin. The bottom of the stone clusters are designed with a, with a two foot depth beneath the basin bottom, while the southerly half of the basin appeared to demonstrate sufficient separation from groundwater based on soil evaluation pit SE12. The same does not hold true for the northerly half of the basin given its proximity to soil evaluation SE11 with a groundwater elevation of 68.5. Number three, plan sheets two, four, and six include the following match line label, match to separate Fruit Street Improvement Plan. And the proposed grading shows that the runoff from Fruit Street is being directed to the proposed drainage, site drainage system. The actual Fruit Street Improvement Plan should be made a part of the site development plan submission in order to ascertain that only a portion of Fruit Street shown on the, water, on the watershed plan sheet 11 is contributing runoff to the proposed site drainage system. Otherwise, the drainage system will need to be reevaluated. Other than the foregoing three review observations, I do not find any other design considerations that could be problematic for a favorable action by the planning board. I would recommend that approval of the site plan by the planning board should include, among other conditions of approval, a condition requiring a certification by the design engineer that the constructed roof drainage downspouts have been connected to the site drainage system as designed and approved. I have copied the applicant's representatives in this email in order to apprise them of my review comments. Let me know if you have any questions or need any additional information. Regards, uh, Azu and De Niro, town engineer. <clears throat> and um, today we did receive um, the correspondence from SEA, uh, the Bridgewater Planning Board, Town of Bridgewater, 66 Central Square, Bridgewater, Mass, Fruit Street Site Plan, the board members in response to the, the comments from the town engineer in an email dated September 2nd, 2020, Silver Engineering Associates provides the following responses. I'm not going to read one, two, and three that Mr. Antonero provided in his email um, in my prior reading. I'll just re read the SEA response. So town engineer comment one that was previously read, uh, SEA response, proposed eight inch water line is proposed to be installed in Fruit Street. Transit pipe will be abandoned in place. Town engineer comment two that was previously read, SEA response, the four stone clusters in basin one were moved to the southern end to ensure a two foot separation of the groundwater. A bottom stone elevated, a, a, bot, a bottom stone elevation was added for, for clarification. Town engineer, comment number three that was previously read, read SEA response. 
the fruit street improvements have been added to sheet 12 to the site plan set. And this was sent by um, Lawrence P. Silva, professional engineer. Okay, so that is all the correspondence. Um, we did receive some uh, additional updates from um, Mr. Romulus to the board. Um, but with that being said, um, I'd, why don't we turn it over to the applicant's representatives? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ed Brennan. I'm the attorney representing the applicant. Uh, I would like to point out, and I hope the board did receive my correspondence to the uh, planning board of August 31st. Uh, I'm not asking that it be read into the record at this point, but I am asking that it be noted and made part of the record. Uh, can you confirm that the board did receive the communication? Um, Ms. Burke and Mr. Romulus? Um, I know we received it in the office. Elijah, did you forward that to the board? Uh, I'm sorry, I was uh, pulling up the site plan um, what was mentioned. The correspondence from um, Attorney Brennan from August 31st, did that get forwarded to the board? Uh, I'll have to confirm that if you can give me a few minutes. Uh, to... I, don't, uh, I don't believe I received anything like it, that. It was acknowledged as received on the 31st with my request that it be circulated to the board members. I'll, I'll look for it right now and send it off. Okay, well, when it is found, if it could be made part of the record, I'd appreciate that. Uh, with that said, uh, Mr. Chairman, you have gone over the, the engineering comments by a town engineer and our engineer's responses. Uh, it might be appropriate now if the, if the board members have any questions of uh, Mr. Silver as to his responses, but it would appear to, to me that uh, we've addressed all of the concerns raised by uh, your town's engineer. Uh, we also have with us tonight, uh, Gary McNaughton from McMahon Transportation Engineers, uh, and he's prepared to address any questions that the board may have uh, regarding the traffic uh, generated by this proposal and how it relates to the NEPA certificate that issued uh, in 2018. Uh, so both Mr. Silver and Mr. McMahon are here and available to answer any questions that the board might have. Uh, I, I emphasize that this entire site has been scrutinized under a microscope through the MEPA process. The ACEC status has been recognized and adhered to uh, throughout the entire process. Uh, my client has worked with uh, Natural Heritage on the turtle issue. That has been resolved. Uh, it doesn't involve this site. I think the, you know, the experts through Division of Fisheries and Wildlife and Natural Heritage have all reviewed that issue and are satisfied with what my client is doing. Uh, there is no archeological uh, site on lot number eight. So it, it's not before the board at this point. Uh, I would like to point out that we have started our hearings before the Conservation Commission. We had our first meeting last week and we will pick that up again uh, so uh, next week will be before the Conservation Commission once again. Uh, so I would like, what I suggest is that if the, if the board has questions of Mr. Silver, uh, or we can have Mr. Mc, uh, McNaughton address the traffic questions at this point in time uh, at the chairman's discretion. So Attorney Brennan, just before we go to Mr. McNaughton, because maybe I think it would be good if he made his presentation. And then we can add the, that might clear up questions before we. Yes. But but just to be fair and to, to everybody, we, we we just got an email. It, it just came through with your with your letter. Um, would you like one of the the town representatives to read that into the record just to be consistent and fair? I suppose I suppose it would be appropriate just so the record is complete. Thank you. So now uh, I have it on my phone, Miss Burke. Uh, Oh, yeah. Mr. Rimes, could one of you could one of you read it? The board, if you want me to read it, I can read it. It's fine. I have it up. Dated August thirty first, two thousand and twenty. Um, Patrick Driscoll, Chairman of the Town of Bridgewater Planning Board. Dear Mr. Driscoll, the following is a response on behalf of the Claremont Com 
on behalf of the Claremont Company to is the issues raised during the initial planning board hearing on August 19, 2020. The Claremont site consists of 168 acres of land, of which 75 acres will remain in its natural state. The subject lot is one of eight lots in the Lakeshore Center development. It is shown as lot eight on a plan entitled Subdivision Modification Lakeshore Center, endorsed by the planning board on October 18, 2017. Four of the other lots have already been developed. Lot eight is accessed by way of Fruit Street and a right of way created to accommodate access to the locust because of the land takings for Route 24 in the 1950s. The site has been thoroughly reviewed under the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, MEPA, several times and has been subject to heightened street need due to its classification as an area of critical environmental concern, ACEC. The findings of the MEPA reviews are set forth in the MEPA certificates and are available online. The project at hand is included in the MEPA certificate, certificate dated October 12, 2018 which sets forth an extensive history of the site's review under MEPA dating back to 1983. The current project described as phase four in the 2018 MEPA certificate. Several of the concerns raised by the neighbors are addressed in the MEPA certificate. For example, number one, archeological concerns. There are no archeological sites on lot eight. Number two, wetland delineation flagged by Mr. Ken Thompson on April 14, 2020. The location of the wetland line is currently before the Bridgewater Conservation Commission pursuant to a notice of intent. The first public hearing was held on August 27, 2020. The accuracy of the wetland line and the location of the building and other site improvements relative to the wetland line are within the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission and will be reviewed by the conservation agent and town engineer. The review by the Conservation Commission will encompass all potential impacts on wetlands, groundwater, and Lake Nipponicket. Number three, Eastern Box Turtle. The locust has been mapped as priority and estimated habitat for the Eastern Box Turtle. The property owner has entered into an agreement with the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, wherein the development of Lakeshore Center is subject to certain pre-development and post-development conditions together with a payment for the Eastern Box Turtle Conservancy Plan to be administered by the Nature Conservancy. Four, traffic. The traffic questions will be answered by Mr. Gary McNaughton of McMahon Associates, Inc., Transportation Engineers and Planners. He will be available during the Zoom meeting on September 2nd, 2020, I think that's. Cool. <laughs> project number five, project description. In, 2018, in the 2018 MEPA certificate, the current project is described as creating 7.6 acres of impervious area and 330 new parking spaces. In fact, the final design proposes 6.4 acres of impervious surface and 197 parking spaces. Number six, lot area building coverage. In a PDD lot area is defined as the total land area within a lot. This includes wetlands. In a PDD, the building coverage is capped at 25%. In this case, the building coverage is 2.36 acres or 10%. Note, see site data sheet five of the site plan. Seven, adjacent municipalities. All adjacent municipalities have been notified as required by law. Eight, snow storage removal. Snow storage, snow removal and storage will be on site. Nine, building lighting. The building will not be visible from Pleasant Street or Lakeshore Center. It will be visible only from Route 24. Lighting will be designed so it does not spill onto adjacent lots. 10, representative tenants. Claremont has developed a first class office park and brought to the town of Bridgewater the following tenants. Claremont Companies, Arbella Insurance, Bank of America, Beacon Health, Senior Whole Life, New York Life, Mass Ioneer, and Catches Law. Based upon some other similar buildings in the Tri-128-495 corridor, the building being proposed is suitable for tenants such as Samsonite, Nestle, Siemens, and Rebound Therapeutics, and other research and development type businesses. 11, tree cutting, drainage culverts. These two issues were raised during the first public hearing. Claremont will consider a donation to replace trees elsewhere in town and to repair or clean the culverts on Pleasant Street 
to assure that they are operational. Further discussion will be required on these two topics. Sincerely, Edmund J. Brennan, Jr. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Attorney Brennan. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have that in our packet. Um, <clears throat> Would you want to hear from Mr. Silver or the traffic engineer at this point? Um, I think it, we've, I think not to, I think if we could hear from the traffic engineer because traffic concerns were raised in letters and if we could hear from the traffic engineer and then we could have the board ask both um, the silver and the traffic engineer questions after the traffic engineer's presentation. Okay, uh, Mr. McNaughton is, is signed in and available. Yes, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Yep. Okay, uh, good evening. Again, Gary McNaughton with McMahon Associates. Um, we've been working on this, this property, this area for a number of years. I think the most recent revision was the 2018 NEPA documents that have been referred to quite a few times this evening. Uh, in those documents, this parcel was included. Uh, it was part of the phase three development and had been looked at, as was noted, as a 92,000 square foot warehouse building. And in that, in that document, it had anticipated honestly, what is a higher trip generation rate than what's being proposed by the current development um, based on newer trip generation information and the proposed land use. Uh, the trip generation is actually a fair amount lower in the peak hour, but even in that 2018 document, the type of use, you know, the, the light industrial warehousing flex building is just not a, a very heavy traffic generator. Um, and, you know, it's while the building's gotten slightly larger than the 92,000 square feet that was proposed, as was noted, the parking has decreased, and, and part of that is that the traffic generation for these types of uses um, is decreased. It's, it's spread over different times of the day so that you're not seeing that concentration. And the other characteristic of this location, uh, much like many of the other parcels in this development, but even more so because of its proposed use and its proximity to Route 24, it's going to be dominated by traffic to and from you know, the east. So that's right turns coming out of Fruit Street that operate you know, much, much easier than the left turns coming out. Uh, the left turns coming in in the morning, uh, you know, not at the, the peak afternoon time when school traffic and other things might be a little bit busier, the college might be busier. Uh, so those, even those entering movements operate well, you know, that westbound volume where they'd be turning from is lighter in the morning. Uh, so those movements operate well. Exiting out of Fruit Street because it's a right turn can work fairly well. Um, and when you look at the Fruit Street Lakeside Drive intersection, it operates you know, with some delay certainly, but it's well below capacity, below any thresholds where you would consider installing a traffic signal. Uh, and certainly you know, installing a traffic signal would be problematic given the proximity to the ramp. So it's not an area where there's a lot of um, easy fixes that you could do. You know, there could be warning signs or the like uh, to help notify people, particularly for um, the Lakeside Drive side of the street to warn people that that is there and to be cautious and courteous of, courteous of that side of the street. Um, but overall, you know, this specific parcel just, just isn't a, a high generator of traffic um, and certainly, you know, generates less traffic than even the existing office buildings uh, that have been on site. With regards to Mass DOT associated with the apartments that are under construction, we are in the process of finalizing permits. Everything's in for them. It's just a matter of them issuing the final permit. They've been a little bit slowed in their remote working uh, environment like many. And as part of that permit, we'll be retiming the signals at the ramps uh, for Route 104, just an acknowledgement of the travel patterns that have changed over the, the number, over the years. Uh, since those were installed and last timed. So that's work that will be happening. I don't envision this particular project um, changing that permit because of the low traffic generation from it. it. It doesn't meet the thresholds of warranting a revision to the permit. We'll, we'll speak with them and if they want to amend it, you know, we would go through that process. But even in their, their previous reviews and meet the filings of the higher trip generation rate, they didn't identify any further measures or mitigation. Uh, normally, I'm sure the board would be asking us for an update on the traffic information that we had prepared. The last time we had counted this location was 2017. Uh, unfortunately, updated traffic counts aren't very uh, applicable at this time and accurate. 
and you know we're working within uh, information that we have and historically that's been available. You know, MassDOT is allowing uh, counts to go back. I think it's 2014 that you can go back and use counts and kind of make do with what's available. So using the 2017 counts that we have and, and the projections that we did at that time for growth and for the other developments that are happening in the area are, are still you know, valid. And you know, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to go out there and update traffic counts quite yet, hopefully soon. All right. Um, <clears throat> before we um, move on, so I'm I'm open to board questions. So if if anybody has a um, a question on the board for the the traffic engineer at this point. Well, just a quick question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is McNaughton. Based on your knowledge, how how likely is the state? To put a traffic light there at Lakeside Drive, how how much more traffic do you need for the state to step in? You'd need even after this project is developed, you'd need it to probably be three times as much on the side streets. You know, just off the top of my head, um, when you start to talk about traffic signals, you know, even on the busiest of roadways. Um, you know, you, if you're not at least at 100 vehicles coming out and, and they tend to focus more on left turns, you know, they're not even gonna start the discussion about a traffic signal at the Lakeside Drive, which has the higher left turning volume, there's 38 that are coming out of there turning left. So um, they're not in a situation that it's close to being warranting a signal. I understand, I just, uh, that's sort of unfortunate for those 38 plus people that are wanna get out there. <coughs> So I'm behind. I mean, they, they can understand the the policy, but it's still their problem getting out in the traffic. Thank you. Yep. Any other traffic questions for the board? <clears throat> uh, from the board? What? I, yeah, I do. I guess I guess I would ask what what would it take to create turning lanes? Uh, turning so lanes are based on the traffic signal because you're saying we can't. We need, to be in, need a lot more traffic, but what about adding turning lanes? There may be enough width out there to do most of it with striping. Um, the, the challenge becomes some of the mass DOT requirements for maintaining shoulder widths to accommodate bicycles um, on any road. So that may be a constraint that, that we may not be able to get a full width turning lane in there. We would have to look at whether or not that's feasible. My other concern with adding a turn lane is that you're going to develop it as you get you know, closer back to the Route 24 ramps. And if you're familiar with how that southbound off ramp works, it, it's kind of a widened area that tapers back in before you get to the Lakeside Drive Fruit Street intersection. And as you start to add in a turning lane, you're going to extend back closer to that and shorten the distance for that ramp traffic to come across to the left and, and almost create some additional friction and conflicts through that area. Um, you're in a, a borderline, and I forget the exact location of the line, but the mass DOT layout ends you know, not far from the interchange and then it's town jurisdiction. So the intersection itself is under the town jurisdiction. Any turning lane would have to be considered um, with mass DOT. And I, I don't know if they, you know, they may, may share some of those concerns about the off-ramp off interaction. All right. What, what about um, considering maybe adding signage, leaving Fruit Street uh, as, a, as a right turn only during peak hours? Uh, you, you can do that. The, the challenge with right turn only is, you know, where, where else do they end up going? And are you pushing them, you know, either through the interchange? Well, actually, this interchange, you can't really do it because it's not the full clover leaf. So are they going across into you know, Home Depot and you're adding left turns into the Home Depot parking lot or something as folks turn around, because there really is no other option. Uh, when you look at the exiting left turns from this site, it's fewer than 10 vehicles, even based on the higher early pro earlier projections in the peak hour. So it's, the left turns aren't going to be, have a dramatic effect um, on, o on the overall traffic flow. Out there. Okay. Any, any more board traffic comments? 
Yeah, uh, what do you estimate the ratio of like uh, truck to uh, uh, passenger vehicle traffic to be, if that makes sense? Yeah, part of that's going to depend on the specific use. I mean, we, you know, it's it, everybody always assumes, you know, even if you've done a, a industrial, you know, a, a typical like Amazon type facility that's a trucking facility, uh, even those are, are at most about 10% trucks because the, the warehouse workers, you know, the the drivers and things coming in and out uh, far outweigh the number of trucks that are going. So, you know, I'm without having it off the top of my, my, at my fingertips, it would be about the 10% max and possibly even a little bit less depending on the specific land use. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so Mr. McNaughton, I just, for clarification, when Mr. Geller asked about a turning lane, Steve, I think what you were asking is if you were coming from you know, coming from like Home Depot towards Rainham, and you want to take a left into the site. You right. were asking if that could be painted so that would there be a left turn lane so traffic could, could still continue to the right of it? Correct, so it doesn't back up. And Mr. McNaughton, were you saying that that's, that piece of road where you would take that left turn, that's under the control of the town or the state, do you know? It's under the town, the intersection itself is under the town's jurisdiction. Uh, as you get back towards the interchange, it becomes state jurisdiction. And, and I honestly forget exactly where that line is, um, but it, it's between obviously the end of the ramp and, and the beginning of the intersection. So any turn lane would be straddling and requiring approval from both parties. So, so Mr. Antonero, would, would that make sense from a, an engineering standpoint from the town would is that something you'd be in favor of looking at a, a, we're just striping a left turn lane or, or not uh so the uh, um they have to at least do a lay it out and see how that uh how many turning lanes you can achieve by striping um but it can be done but we have to we have to see it laid out but but as a town engineer just the, just from board comments, is that something you think is a reasonable idea or, or something that we shouldn't consider? Well, I don't see, I don't see why it will not be reasonable. Okay. Yeah, the, the one concern that, that I stated is, you know, with Mass DOT and their requirements for bicycle facilities, you know, we could certainly pursue it. It's just, I, I can't guarantee their approval of it. Um, they require, you know, shoulder widths. Generally, they're looking for five feet. You have about 42 feet of pavement out there. So, you know, if you put in three lanes, you're looking at at least 33, maybe as much as 35 or 36 feet. So that's not leaving you enough space to meet their bicycle requirements. So that, that may be a sticking point. But other than that, you know, the physical space of putting in a <coughs> lane, you know, is there. Okay, are there any more board questions on traffic? So maybe it's a good time to um, jump to Mr. Silva, because one, one thing that we didn't see that probably relates to traffic is there's a, a Fruit Street improvement plan that was added. Yeah, that was primarily for utilities, but uh, it was presented as part of um, the additions that were in response to the town engineer's comments. Uh, I do, just before you get off of that though, there was a comment that was brought up at the last meeting that you might want to have uh, Mr. McMahon actually uh, deal with, McNaughton, I'm sorry, <laughs> Gary McNaughton, deal with. And that was uh, the question that had come up is eastbound traffic on Pleasant Street uh, trying to utilize um, the Old Pleasant, which is the commuter parking area in order to bypass that intersection and whether or not it made sense to have signage that did not allow for a right-hand turn at that um, at the end of that commuter area there. Do you understand what I'm saying, Gary? Yeah, I, I, first I, th I thought you were talking about to loop back up to 104, which wasn't making sense to me, but I, I see what you're saying to avoid that. Um, probably be a slower trip for them. I'd be surprised if anybody did it, but there, there shouldn't be a lot of park and riders that are the, then going back to this facility. So I, I think, a, you know, right no, it was, no, it was for, some, for someone who was eastbound coming to the site, who instead of going up to the intersection and turning on Fruit Street, would decide to sh 
short circuit it by going through Old Pleasant Street, right? Um, in right. order to make it. So if we were to place an, uh, a no right turn uh, sign at the end of that, um, yeah, I wouldn't see any negative effect of that. Um, you know, again, those, those commuter parkers would have no reason to turn right, so it would only be to prohibit uh, right. folks entering this building. So it, it would seem to have no no negative effect of adding that no right turn sign. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't you actually create the curbing so you wouldn't be able to take a right hand turn without hitting the curb? My, well, it's my kind of, one, it's awkward now. Yeah, my one I, I don't know what you know Mass DOT. I'm guessing plows that lot in the winter and you know, you can return to that maintenance depot. So they may, may not love the idea of restricting that movement. Okay. You know, they, they'd have to weigh in. But. And, and um, they tried that up at the pediatrician's office and they're still taking right turns, uh, left turns in and left turns out up at the pediatrician's office, even though it's, angled right yeah the, the best you know with engineering we, we, we try to make it clear but you know really the only way to prohibit left turns is is a raised medium and even sometimes then people get creative so, mm -hmm. so 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 i think we all saw the condition of fruit street on the sidewalk and i think that uh, there were some comments about water and sewer having to go down that so mr silver could you just explain yeah from where from where you begin where you plan to begin this work where you plan to end this work and what the what the um, fruit street improvement plan consists of at this point okay so fruit street was as we talked about before that was the original pleasant street so there is a water line a six inch water line that goes under route 24 and then continues along this road and connects out um, at pleasant street at the intersection of uh, uh, Fruit and Pleasant. So what, um, at first we were going to keep that uh, and actually use that as part of a looping arrangement and put in a new uh, eight inch line in the street in order to um, create that looping. But the water department, um, and also you can heard the comments of the town engineer, um, they're in agreement that uh, we're just going to abandon that um, uh, transite pipe and replace it with that eight inch line. But the difference in doing that, which is what we're showing on this plan, is that you now have to um, connect the state facilities uh, to that, that replacement line. And we also uh, are showing the addition of two uh, hydrants along Fruit Street, uh, which would be connected to that line also. Uh, now, the other utilities that are, will be in the line, in the Fruit Street as part of this project are um, the sewer line. So there'll be a sewer line that will um, come from this project and then uh, go down Fruit Street and it will connect to the force main that, uh, that we did way back in 2000. Um, it will connect into that one at the intersection of Pleasant and Fruit. And uh, there will be a gas, natural gas line brought down, uh, which is kind of exciting because it was always difficult to get gas uh, in this area. And uh, starting from the access project um, and moving eastward, uh, the gas company has brought uh, natural gas in from Raynham from that side. And this will be uh, bringing it as far, you know, the furthest point east. Um, and that, uh, that will be also in the road. Once those utilities are all um, brought down and connected into the, into the project, uh, then the, uh, the street will be um, resurfaced uh, the entire length uh, from the entrance all the way to uh, uh, the intersection of Pleasant Street. So that's basically the improvements along there. There were some bullet items that were shown on the plan itself that identified exactly what I was saying. So just so I'm clear that what, what does the repaving entail? Is that just grinding down the existing and, and putting a top coat on or is that to the town standards or what, what is that? Entail? Well, it's not, it's not to the town standards for new construction because this is gonna be is that all the areas where the, uh, where the utilities were put in will be put in, they will be trenched, there'll be, um, 
asphalt placed down at that point. And then there will be um, the entire uh, roadway will be uh, uh, will be cold plain, and then basically a new surface will be put so that we match the same elevations uh, that are there now along that whole length. Uh, and remember, right at the entrance, as you recall from the site walk, there is an area that the state kind of abused a little bit by just uh, filling over the pavement that was there. So all that material has to be taken out also at that time. At our last meeting, um, Mr. Romulus recommended that we waive one of the sidewalk or the connectivity um, provisions in the plan development district because it would it would it would require you know crossing wetlands and, and such to connect that building to other buildings within the plan development district. But I thought somebody had mentioned that there is a plan to add sidewalks somewhere in this area. Is that true? And if so, where, where would they be added? That, well, there was that project was actually approved uh, at the last conservation meeting. Uh, that that is sidewalks that were tied to the the Viva uh, project. Uh, so uh, as part of that uh, 300 unit uh, uh, project, uh, the sidewalk uh, at Lakeshore Center will be extended westwardly uh, across in front of the hotel site, the office site, the hotel site, all the way down to access. And there will also be another um, crosswalk right in front of Lakeshore Center with an LED um, warning sign for a pedestrian uh, to just like the one that's down at access right now. So that's going to actually improve uh, uh, pedestrian movement in the areas where there is really a need for it. This, this site doesn't have that kind of uh, to and from for, uh, you know, for pedestrian flow. You don't really want to encourage pedestrian flow coming up to the single uh, site up here. Um, and there's no, and there's no physical way to uh, connect a, a sidewalk from this project across to the uh, central upland area where the uh, beaver is located because the wetland system is uh, extensive and it is not possible to go across it. It's not even possible to go across it with utilities. And that's why all the utilities are coming in from Fruit Street. So, Ms. Dantanero, have you reviewed this um, improvement plan in, in terms of pavement and such? Are you satisfied with what they're proposing? Um, so I did receive it. Um, and can that be expanded because the uh, proposed grading, uh, if you look at, if you go from this site and go sort of northwesterly where it takes a bend to head towards so, um, Pleasant Street, uh, the, that grading isn't very legible, right? Right about where the cursor, where the cursor the arrow is right now. Can you zoom into that, zoom into that one? That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now go, go towards the project itself. Along along the length of that. Right. Keep going. Yes. Yeah. There are no changes. There's no proposed changing in the, in the surface grades along that stretch until you get right next to the entrance. Okay. You can see the boxed in uh, elevations in blue. Yeah, uh, 92, okay. Yeah, that, I wanted to make sure that you don't have a, a whole stretch beyond that 92 contour um, okay. going towards the site, so that's good. So basically I wanted to verify that the, uh, um, uh, the amount of pavement on the uh, access roadway is in fact limited to what is shown in the watershed plan, so I'm fine with it. But, but I guess my concern is is that we don't end up with another Elm Street that we so my question is is after this is after this water and sewer line and gas line are put in, is there a standard that's going to be followed for repaving it with a binder coat and a top coat so that it won't have to be redone by the town in five years? 
Is the, is the whole thing going to be repaved binder and top coat? Or is no, it, no, that's not that's not what's being proposed. Because I mean, once these utilities are in place, they've been trenched in, they've been paved over. Now, now it's going to be resurfacing that road. Uh, so you're going to uh, you're going to coal plane it down, and then you're going to put in a finished surface over it um, from you know from point A to point B. Uh, it's not planned to be uh, doing full depth reclamation of the entire roadway. That's that's not what was in the uh, proposal. Is is what is that going to be suitable for a number of years, or is that is that going to be have to be upgraded by the town in the near future? Uh, I, I I don't see that it would be problematic for the town at this point. I mean. Uh, but that's 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 what we've been proposing to do. It'll meet the the needs for the site, the single use that's here. Um, the state has some activity that they're the only ones that have been putting any wear and tear on uh, on Fruit Street to this point. Um, and and we certainly got to coordinate with uh, uh, with the town engineer and with uh, and Ronnie Ledoux also when that work is done. So, I mean, a condition that says that, you know, to the, uh, that it would be done uh, in accordance with the requirements um, from the highway department, I think that uh, is, uh, I think that's a way of covering that issue. But we're not going in and putting, we're not planning to putting in curb, sidewalk, or any of that. It's just basically the, the running surface, uh, replacing the top, uh, portion of that. Do you have any comments on that, Mr. Antonio? Well, that's really not going to be a town roadway, but that section there, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's it's a single purpose roadway. I don't see why, the, uh, how and why it would be a responsibility of the town to maintain that. Well, I think, I think that uh, the chairman is asking about the section of Fruit Street. Fruit, I mean, so Fruit Street, is, when we do that sidewalk, Fruit Street's in pretty rough shape. So my, I guess my question is, is, is once it's in, it's in rough shape to begin with, then you're going to bring a water line, a sewer line, and a gas line down it. Is just putting a top coat on that after, after sufficient, or do we need a, a full depth road reconstruction so that it's, so that the town isn't re replacing the portion that it owns of Fruit Street in the near future. Okay, so that can be a condition of approval, Mr. Chairman. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's a good idea or not. I, well, I, well, I guess it will be. You will need a full depth excavation, or excuse me, reconstruction. If in fact the trench work, when they backfill the trenches, if they're not, if they're not using flowable fill, then you will need a because there there will be a natural settlement of these trenches. But if they use a flowable fill, then you can just do it. Uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Summary from Wikipedia. Controlled low strength material. So so I guess I guess we don't have to look at it now, Ms. Dentonero. Maybe you can make a, a recommendation whether what they're proposing is fine or whether something else should be proposed. I just yeah. I just wanna I just wanna make sure that whatever road is finished that the town is gonna own is able to service their needs and that two or three years down the road, we're not faced with re repaving that or trying to do a full depth re reclamation on our own when we could either coordinate and do something with them now or have them do it. Or I just I just think that that should be looked at by you and, and give us a recommendation. No, no. Keep, keep, keeping in mind that this is a town road, that's a town road that is supposed to be servicing this area. Um, I, it's not like uh, Elm Street, which had a, uh, I guess there were grant money and so forth that was was spent to do the entire Elm Street uh, roadway. Um, I think there needs to be some sort of compromise in here in terms of how, how much developers and how much the towns to bring this uh, road back into shape. Maybe the state even, because the state's the one that's kind of abused uh, that that roadway uh, over the last, uh, how many years would that be? That's like uh, 50, uh, 70 years, maybe? No, I, years? I, would, 
I, I would agree, and I'm not, I'm not trying to put it all on the on Claremont. I'm just one that that road is in pretty poor shape, and the town has not maintained it, and the state hasn't maintained it, frankly. And I'm just, I'm afraid that if if all this construction happens to bring well, that's that that would be that would be a correct statement, and I under I I understand what uh, where Mr. Silva is coming from. However, however, a lot of the truck traffic, at least construction wise. A lot of the construction traffic that will be associated with this and then, can, and then all the trench work that will be involved, um, it'll, it'll exist. Oh my word. It's, can we mute the board that I'm I, I getting a lot of feedback? Yeah, so I guess, I guess my point is, Mr. Antonio, could you just look at what they're proposing and tell us that it's adequate or it needs adjustment? And then we can. Oh, that's, that's what I'm. That's what I'm getting at. But I'm getting a lot of feedback uh, with our uh, people's speakers being on. Um, yes. Uh, just to uh, uh, sort of uh, respond to Mr. Silver a little bit. I agree that there's really some bad shit. But at the end of the day, uh, there is no ongoing construction. It's basically about traffic load on that road. With the proposed excavation work uh, and the clearing up even further, we definitely need to look at that. And I will I will discuss this with the uh, highway superintendent and come up with the uh, recommendation on how to. But that is something that will definitely need to be addressed. Okay. So I just, Mr. Silver, can I ask one more question? Just then, then I'll I'll stop asking questions. Could you, one thing I wrote down from everybody's, most of the, the comment letters or the concerns was, was the drainage system. And I understand how it works, but just for the public's benefit, because in, if Mr. Antonero could verify it, could you just explain how that drainage system works, whether or not you need to fertilize it to keep the grass green, how clean the water is once it leaves, just so that people understand, you know, is it low impact design? Is it not low impact design? Just so people understand what you're proposing and how it works. Okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, I would say uh, there was a concern about how, uh, how much was going to recharge and find its way back to the uh, to the lake. Um, I would say that you pretty much 100% of it gets recharged at some point. Uh, some bit goes directly into the ground. Some bit goes through. Um, the, the cleaning process of oil grit separators and sediment four bays, and then find its way to a, a, a large open basin. And then from there, it gets throttled and discharged to a wetland system, which is 1,200 feet, I believe, from Pleasant Street. So there is, um, this water finds its way through there, the grassed open basins, become uh, friendly for habitat. Uh, we often see in these kinds of basins that uh, deer will come in uh, and, and other, other wildlife, fox and coyotes and stuff will come in and, and use them. They actually are an available source of, of water for them when, they're, uh, when there isn't some water somewhere else. Um, the, the growth that's there uh, as far as how it's managed um, it's, it's usually cut down along the edges, sometimes in the basins themselves, the basin bottoms. Sometimes it's maintained as a grass bottom, and sometimes it's allowed to go to uh, uh, more of a wetland vegetation that kind of would take over uh, any time that, it, you know, if it sees water on a frequent basis. But it's, it's not a, um, it's not a, a, a system that is um, contrary to the objectives of, of, the, of the Taunton River watershed. And for anyone who is looking to make sure that Lake Nip is, uh, is cared for, uh, we, we, we design it so that we, we treat the water that needs to be treated and that we uh, are responsible in terms of how it's routed and how it find its way into the wetlands eventually. Um, but as far as uh, uses of pesticides and, uh, and fertilizers and so forth, uh, it, those kind of concerns, um, you can definitely uh, put restrictions on some of that. 
But some of those questions, uh, I would actually defer to the landscape uh, uh, designer because there's a landscape architect involved, uh, Hawk, and uh, you know, and they're pretty explicit about uh, their requirements for uh, how you know how those areas are, are treated in the future. Any other board questions? Um, yeah, where, where, where are we now, Mr. Driscoll, in terms of questions? Any questions or? Any, any questions and then <clears throat> once the board is done with their questions, we can open it up to, I see chats coming in, questions. All right, yeah, I, I, have, I have, well, I have a number of questions, but the, the it seems to me that the uh, we've had the lengthy discussion on traffic, and um, I'm not sure how the traffic can be resolved here. It's 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 unfortunate that it sounds like not going to be resolved in a positive way for the Lakeside Drive residents. But the one thing that has stuck in my mind, and it, much of the uh, letters that were sent to us, has to do with the environment. Um, and I have a general question before, and if, if I suspect the answer will be no, and then, then I'll have a bunch of little questions, but I think much of the issues regarding the environment could be solved very easily by downsizing this entire project in terms of uh, runoff and open and uh, parking lots and so forth. Is that a consideration at all, or are we dealing with uh, this project on this entire parcel that we have to uh, consider? Um, I, I, who, who you, go ahead, do you take that? Yeah, on behalf of the, of the property owner, I mean, the, the project is, as we, we stand by the project as presented. Uh, we do believe that we have, we have addressed and can address the environmental concerns. Uh, the 100 foot wetland buffer is, is simply a jurisdictional issue that triggers the review by the Conservation Commission. So it, it's not a, as you all know, it's not a 100 foot no touch. The town of Bridgewater has the 25 foot no touch, which we have respected. It's the 100 foot buffer that triggers the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. And it's our burden to design it to their satisfaction. And I think we can't, we have, and we can do that. And I think we can address the environmental concerns that have been raised through state of the art engineering and stormwater management. So I, I think the project uh, environmentally as presented is sound. And I think the experts involved in it will be able to show the planning board and the conservation commission why that is correct. So I, I can't say that we would, we're in a position to downsize the project. I mean, when you look at the site data chart on the plans, uh, Mr. Silver prepared the total sites 24.8 and wetlands are 13.1. So the, the wet the 13.1 is not being touched. You know, the total improvements to the site are 10.8. So we, there is a large amount of this site due to the fact that it's wetlands remains untouched. And we can protect those wetlands by proper engineering, which is I think, which is what we have done as we have done on the, the remainder of the site that's been developed off of Lakeshore Center Drive. So I think we can engineer this and address those concerns. Well, considering the, uh, the potential danger to this site, I mean, it's not a normal site, it's a protected site, including the, the NIP and the weight line and so forth. Uh, it seems to me we have to be extra careful on this site. Um, and you're saying that, and, and I'm, I don't doubt that you, you're, using all the engineering that you knowledge to protect the site. Would you agree to, um, for instance, have the Taunton River watershed lines take a look at your engineering regarding the uh, runoff? So the, with the, the drain, all the drainage calculations and the design have all been filed with the Conservation Commission as part of the filing requirements and as public information. Uh, and, and I do point out again, as, as you just noted, it's, a, it's the, being an ACEC, when this went through all of the state reviews under MEPA, it was given strict, a strict scrutiny because of that classification. 
uh, and the state agencies came through with recommendations that would allow this development. So we have taken the ACEC seriously uh, and we've had to design accordingly. Uh, if the Taunton River Watershed Alliance, uh, they have full access to all of our engineering data. Why? Yeah, one of the, excuse me, one, one of the items that they mentioned in their letter is that they were asking us to look at permeable pavements and so forth. Well, quite honestly, that is actually contrary to tr trying to protect the environment. Because if there were a, uh, a spill or anything that occurred, you use permeable pavements, you're going to have more of a potential issue than having solid pavements, which you can control where that uh, spill is, be able to clean it up and make sure that it doesn't find its way to the wetlands. So um, I think that if you, their letter, they, they said what they wanted. And, uh, and I believe that, you know, with the exception of not doing permeable pavements, I think that we, we are meeting uh, what they were asking for. Larry, if I understand that permeable pavements mean they're like paving blocks, whether they be six by 12 or something to that effect that I use instead of the asphalt, but there's no pretreatment on the recharge at that point. It goes yeah, well, you run the there. risk of having ah. stuff get out that wouldn't get out otherwise. Yeah, you It's different ways of doing it, but, but in essence, it's not, it's not impervious, 100% impervious the way that a paved surface is. And, uh, and, I, I, and quite honestly, uh, it's a great concept in other regions of the country, but in this Northeast, when you go through wintertime, uh, freeze thaw cycles and so forth, any, any one of those kind of projects that I've seen that have tried to use that uh, has, has turned out to be a mess. Uh, one in particular was, uh, I think it was in Easton, was uh, the library, I believe it was. And uh, that place was a holy mess after a couple of seasons. You know, it's just, it's not, it's not a practical alternative in, in the Northeast, at least that's from my perspective. Why, um, why clear cut? Are you clear cutting the entire um, project? Well, we're clear cutting what's needed to do the grading to achieve the project. So it's not, so when you say clear cut, we're, clear, we're cutting the areas that need to be graded. So we're not cutting within the 25 foot no touch. Um, pretty much the rest of the site has to be changed in grade and you know, the slope of the grade and, and, and so forth. So you can't leave areas, we're leaving all the wetland areas, not touching any of that, and the 25 foot buffer for certain. But the rest of it, in order to be able to put a warehouse at a single elevation, to have the parking lot feed all the basins and everything, you, you can't keep the elevations that are there. You have to uh, adjust the elevations. And so that means the vegetation has to go. If, if I understand correctly, Mr. Silver, the site improvements are 10.8 acres, which is 43% of the site. Is right. it, is it, am I correct that the rest of it, albeit being wetlands, is undisturbed? That's correct. So it's, so it's a 43%. And it's, and it's buffered by the open drainage basin. And as we pointed out last time, is that um, the majority of the eastern part of this project doesn't even uh, really go into that. There's no pavement in the 100 foot buffer. There is a portion of the building and, and pavement on the, um, on the westerly edge of, is it Wesley? I think Wesley edge of the, of the site, which is in the 100 foot buffer zone. But there's a good portion of it that's not. And we're not changing the drainage patterns in terms of the direction that water flows. We're trying to uh, not disrupt the, uh, the quantity that finds its way into the wetland system either through recharge or direct runoff after it's treated. Uh, I, I don't see that there's, a, uh, that there's anything that we've sacrificed here in terms of how the drainage is being handled. Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, one more observation that we made during the site walk is, uh, you know, the, the, when, once this is done, it will be engineered to you know, all the current rules and regulations. 
uh, or a good distance from the from Lake Nip. Uh, it might be the furthest building from Lake Nip that's been constructed to date. And certainly the activity on our site being up to today's standards, we won't have uh, the, the construction equipment activity that you see on the state site. Uh, we will be, you know, further, much further along in state of the art engineering. And I, I think <coughs> it'll, it'll have water, municipal water and municipal sewer. So we don't have uh, Title V, any Title V system along the lake that's going to contribute in any way. We'll, so I think environmentally, uh, we've done everything possible to develop this site in, in accordance with good engineering practices. Okay. So, and then just a reminder that this, the, the wetlands and whatnot will be reviewed by the Conservation Commission and that's ongoing, so. That's pending, correct. Um, any, uh, Mr. Ajemian, any other questions? I don't, Not right now. Any other board questions for either um, the attorney, the traffic engineer, or the uh, engineer, Mr. Silva? Yeah, I, I have one, Larry. So, so thank you for explaining the uh, the asphalt uh, permeability. So, because I, I believe me, does it have to be like a, a system underneath that to catch what goes through it? If uh, if you're saying if it's a permeable, yes, it it becomes uh, very very difficult to do that. You have to, yeah, you would have to put in liners underneath that would. Yep basically capture it and then convey it horizontally. But uh, as I said to you, you know, you get into free store cycles, all that stuff goes to hell. Okay. And then you plow it, you plow it a few times. So, so bringing up plowing it and storage of, of where you're storing these. I mean, if we have a big, huge snowstorm and you're putting up a large mound uh, and wherever you put these mounds, when that snow starts to melt, which will have road salt from stand, sand trucks and everything else. Does that get caught in the, in the system before it goes into the wetlands? Yeah, it, get, yeah, it gets caught to go drain into the, into the catch basin system and go through the oil grit separators and, and it finds its way to the sediment fall bay. It, it's, it's supposed to find its way right through as if it were rainfall, but it's starting solid and then ending up in a liquid form. It's so not, we're, we're not storing, we're not pushing snow into the drainage basin or anything like that. So you're not going to push any snow over these prefab retaining walls that are going up against the, the wetlands? No, absolutely not. But just quickly, but if, if it is done, then the salt is going to go through, correct, Larry? If somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to, you're asking me, Will something, some other consequence happen? Yeah, I mean, if somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to do, then there's always a consequence to something like that. But right. that's not how it's going to be managed. Right. Because I, I up at Maca Basket, I know that they're, they're told they can't dump snow over that wall. And that's I correct. Seen, and, I haven't seen, and I haven't seen them do it yet all the years they've been there. That, that's just something I, I hope that Claremont Properties will make sure that that doesn't happen here. Well, conservation is going to put stipulations on that stuff, too. Yeah. as far as controls and that's in our in the maintenance plan as to how you how you handle site conditions now when you get those massive snowstorms uh there will maybe be a point at which snow needs to be removed from the site uh by truck to a, a off-site location yeah uh if you had something that was basically uh a, a rare event uh you know a 20 inch 24 inch kind of snowstorm but for normal snowstorms um you know, you may lose a little bit of a parking area for a while, but that's that's typical of any location. Yeah, that's any, fine. I, any, I, was just, I, was, I was just thinking of the contents of the snow going getting into the wetlands. So yeah, right. No, but to uh, to uh, to to uh, Mr. Gellis, to our point though, the Conservation Commission does have a regulatory mechanism to say no chemical de-icing or. Uh, yeah. Soil uh, or salt uh, was sh shall be allowed or utilized, so they can uh, they can stipulate that, and they have that they have that regulatory authority to do that. And, and Mr. Antonio, don't we typically put in our conditions for site plans that snow can't be dumped into the drainage basin? Yeah, we uh, we, have that, we that is one of the standard conditions that we have. 
that there was snow dumping, because if you dump the snow in this drainage basin, and it defeats the purpose of the basin to serve as a, a stormwater management system. That's correct. And, and that can be an ongoing requirement that does not expire with the issuance of any certificate of uh, compliance or occupancy. Uh, to the point about the, uh, <clears throat> about the uh, previous pavements, you know, porous pavements, those are all uh, great and sexy ideas, but um, from a practical standpoint, whoa, I've used those, uh, well, and I'm telling you from a maintenance standpoint, they are, they are nothing but a, a headache. And, uh, and uh, I, I've, I hear a lot of people talk about low impact development, low impact development. It's a great idea. But when you have a site like this, that you're doing, it becomes a lot more a maintenance issue to try to handle those. And so that what you have here, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Jeez. So I do think that um, can people, if you're not talking or something, can you take your phone or something off a speaker? It, and that's what's kind of providing that feedback. Um, so I definitely will not recommend those for this application here. And I don't want to sound like a, a proponent here or an advocate, but I deal with regulations all the time. They've got they've gone through a MEPA, a MEPA where it's not they were push over. They went through a MEPA for their uh, site use, and they were given uh, uh, a specific requirement for coverages, minimum open spaces, uh, and how much. They're not even proposing any wetlands alteration because that will not be allowed anywhere in an ACEC. And they're not proposing any wetlands alteration. Their building is more than 50 feet from the wetlands. Their all site activities are no less than 25 feet from the wetlands lines. So it, if they are meeting all those requirements imposed by uh, uh, MEPA, um, I, I, I think it were, we have to, the purpose of having regulations and guidelines, design standards. Now, if those are not met, I will be the first to tell you they are not met. Uh, but if they meet all the requirements, you allow a certain amount of imp imp uh, minimum open space, and they exceed that minimum open space, at some point, people have the, 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 the whole idea of having that if, <laughs> If they are designing the project to what somebody else is lacking is, then what is the, why do you own the project in the first place? So if, if, if there's no compliance for requirements, if they are not complying with the, our requirements, I will be the first one telling you to do, uh, that they are not meeting the requirements and you've got to uh, uh, require them to meet those. So you can put the conditions of approval, which this board has historically had a very good and robust set of uh, approval requirement conditions. I just saw an email uh, uh, while I'm talking. I just saw a quick uh, chat that talks about to stay away from 100 feet from the wetlands. 100 feet relative to wetlands, it's a jurisdictional line. That is not a buffer requirement under the Wetlands Protection Act or under the local wetlands bylaw. That is just something that triggers regulate of the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission, in which case the commission has the authority to regulate the activities inside that 100 foot. So there is no requirement anywhere, federal, state, or local, that says you must be 100 feet away. That is just a jurisdictional line that says they have authority. And so I would uh, encourage the board to sort of focus more on those items that are, that are under the purview of the planning board and then let the Conservation Commission also do its work relative to the wetlands. I don't think uh, that the board should be really uh, encumbered with too much discussion about wetlands because it's really, not the, it's really, with all due respect, 
It's not the jurisdiction of, the, of this board. Neither would I recommend, I wouldn't go to Conservation Commission and I ask them to start worrying about sight distance or, uh, uh, because it's not their function. So I think uh, anything that has to do with the wetlands needs to be relegated uh, or directed to, to the Conservation Commission. Okay, so if there's no more board questions for um, the traffic engineer or Mr. Silva or Attorney Brennan, are there any before we open it up to the public comment? I have none. And I just ask that um, if the public does want to comment, that you state your name and address for the record and um, you keep your comments or questions to, to under three minutes. Pat, excuse me, once, I'm sorry. But before you do that, the board may want to just review the site walk that you took late earlier last or late last week, just because of well, the public has comments about your site walk, they may want to add that. So if you want to add that as part of your discussion. All right, so, so does, does, any, does, any, does anybody um, that, that attended the site walk from the, from the board or, or Mr. Geller, I think you did it on your own, correct? Uh, it was it was pouring rain today, so I only got to the end of Fruit Street. Does anybody have any comments or, or questions from the site walk? I'll just say just a general comment. Uh, it was a, a beautiful strand of trees in there, just a gorgeous area to um, have set up a campground or something. Um, it would, um, I suppose maybe it's, it's um, biased to trees, but I hate to see them cut down. They're all cut down, that's all. Any other um, board comments from the site walk? Okay, so I would just say that I was surprised at the condition. I, I mean, I knew Fruit Street was in poor condition. It's just, it's too bad, too bad the town has let it get to that point of the state of whoever's responsible for it. So um, so with that being said, could Mr. Romulus, could we open up the public comment? And just uh, again, keep you, state your name and address for the record, keep your comments to three minutes or less. And if we've heard it before, or if it was already read into the record in a letter, we just ask that you not uh, repeat the same comments. Uh, yes, so the first um, comment that appeared in the chat was from uh, Pat Neary, if she would like to uh, sp speak on it. Well, I, we see that we see the comments. Why don't we just ask if anybody, if Miss Neary would like to speak. She doesn't have to. We could see the comment. She could raise her hand. If not, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, yes, her hand is raised. So um, if you would like to unmute yourself. Uh, Pat. Okay, Pat Neary, 225 Lakeside Drive. Um, I have uh, prepared some comments, but uh, we've discussed a lot of them. So I'll try to, if you can bear with me, I'll try to throw out some of the ones we've already talked about. Um, I do see, or at least Attorney Brennan said that uh, everyone, all of the abutting uh, towns that would be of concern have been notified. The last meeting I asked if Raynham had been notified, so I suspect they have been now, but uh, I don't know if you've heard from anyone there. Uh, maybe they are just concerned about their aquifer as I am. Um, the project is of cr great concern to me and other residents. The fact that this land is in the Hockamock Swamp area of critical environmental concern it does require closer scrutiny to protect these sensitive wetlands. I think uh, Mr. Ajamian had a good suggestion about reducing the size of the building. Um, the 100 foot setback that we keep trying to get the proponent to adhere to, I think probably is more for the CONCOM. However, the planning board would probably be the one to suggest the reduction of the size of the building, I think. I don't, I really don't know. 
um, where one board begins and the other one ends. So just bear with me. Um, a proponent is seeking to reduce the wetland setback by about 75%. This is unacceptable. There should be no building or alteration within that 100 foot setback. The original plan was for a huge building of 90,000 square feet and now has expanded the plan to 103,000 square feet. That's a 10,000 square feet. That's, that's over two acres. Anyway, um, also the building could be three stories or four stories. It's just a huge project. And the proponent is attempting to use every square inch of land that is there and that is their right since they own it. However, it's just not acceptable. They should consider a reduction instead of an expansion. Um, we've already discussed the impervious surface, so uh, I'm still concerned that this building and all the paving is right over the Raynham Zone 2 aquifer. The aquifer travels under Route 104 over to Lake Nipponicket and is uh, identified on the MAPS GIS map as a perennial stream. These are protected waters. So I guess, once again, we have to talk to the CONCOM about this, but they seem very, very relaxed about this whole subject. I'm not sure why, because their job is to protect the environment and the waters. We know in the past that our planning board has requested careful lighting installations. However, that has not been complied with along Route 104. This is a very important issue as the general public is realizing the effect that lighting affects so many animals and insects and our dark skies are not dark anymore. If you look over there at the Mass DOT, the Claremont building, the Marriott, the Axis, there just are, are no dark skies anymore. And many of our Massachusetts towns have passed dark sky ordinances. Some of these improvements were included in our own zoning recodification, but that plan didn't reach completion. I hope you will request and enforce whoever comes before you to ask them and enforce down lighting and secure lighting so it doesn't migrate off of their properties. That's very important. With a building of this magnitude, it would also make sense to encourage solar. I mean, they've got this huge big building and it would be great to put solar on it. And restrictions on chemicals or grass, uh, you know, fertilizers and snow melt should be in place. We cannot keep poisoning our water and our planet. One more thing, as Mrs. Hansen has mentioned before and Mr. Ajamian mentioned tonight, they're going to clear, sadly, acres of trees are going to be cleared. And Mr. Ajamian mentioned uh, replacement funding. That would be great, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Wherever they put up new trees, it's important to make sure they are Northeast native species. You can't just put any bushes up. Uh, if you look at the, the barrier in front of the Marriott, they were supposed to put a, uh, a buffer so that the lights didn't come off the parking lot. They've got these scrawny branches over there and they should be full this time of year, but they aren't. So I think we have to do something about requesting and then enforcing because once the request is done, there is no enforcement. We have to correct that. And thank you for listening to me. Mr. Ramos, anybody up next? Uh, yes, um, I think uh, Ms. Raymondetta made some comments related to traffic. I don't know if there's any additional comments um, that she has. Hi, good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to reiterate that, you know, uh, I'm not sure it wasn't mentioned at what time of year the study was done, the traffic study, but if it's done during 
when school is in session, when the college is in session, there are certainly more than 38 trips out of our neighborhood taking a left turn on that uh, 104. So I would ask that a additional traffic study be done. However, in the midst of COVID, it be done after <laughs> uh, COVID has uh, hopefully left. Um, to have a realistic picture, because I, when I heard the number 38, I was shocked. There's no way that our 70 households in the Lakeside Drive neighborhood and all the children <laughs> and the kids um, that live in our area, uh, that that doesn't um, generate more than, than 38 uh, trips. I'd also just like to flag my comment about the zoning. And I know that that's a pending issue is in my letter, but um, uh, if you could address that uh, at some point in your studies of this project, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, comment was made by a Mr. Uh, Gadget. I get. Um, this was also related to this traffic study. Um, let's see the next. Uh, oh, hello, yeah. hello uh, sir. It's not Gadget, although I've been called Inspector Gadget once in a while. My name is John Jagat, and I live at 245 Lakeside Drive. You know, thank you, uh, first of all, to the planning board uh, members for uh, acknowledging uh, Denise's in my letter. Uh, and um, I just want to let the um, applicant know that Denise and I are really are supporters of smart development in Bridgewater. I was a business person and uh, understand what it takes to run a business profitably. So um, I, you know, I am all for smart development. I'd like to know if the, it's okay to let the record show that the comments that came in from two people that wrote letters, um, one at 75 Greenbrier Lane and the other one at 243 Curve Street, don't live anywhere near Lake Nipponicket, okay? Um, and I think that's important to let the record show that these people are not really probably familiar um, with the conditions that have like, you know, impacted our area from the development of uh, Claremont, you know, corporations activities here. One of the things that um, my neighbor Pat Neary asked about was about RAINAM and its effect on RAINAM. And I, I don't think the question was phrased properly. The phrase I would say is that I would ask attorney Brennan, um, who did, who was contacted in the city of RAINAM or town of RAINAM? And did he get a confirmation that uh, someone acknowledged that they received that information? Um, that was not presented. And so I'd like to know that, sir, please. Um, on the other side is that uh, the engineer talked all about utility improvements, you know, on the, in the area of uh, Fruit Street. And, you know, all of those utility improvements are for the applicant's benefit, right? They're not for any resident Bridgewater uh, benefit, right? No, no resident from Bridgewater is gonna benefit from any of those utility improvements. Um, and uh, the traffic study last issue is the 2017 traffic study that Mr. McNaughton re, um, discussed. Um, 2017 does not represent 2020. Um, the, the development that has gone on in this area from 2017 to 2020 is significant and has made a huge impact on traffic here in this area. So I asked the planning board to please do an updated traffic study, ask the state to do it, ask someone to do this, I'm not sure who, but please do an updated traffic study before you approve this piece, uh, this development. Think about it, when trying to exit Lakeside Drive currently, I know people and I've done it before. Instead of taking a left, I take a right. I take a right out of Lakeside Drive and then I take a left into 
the parking lot, right? The um, commuter lot. And then I drive through the commuter lot and then I take a left on Fruit Street to be able to take a right onto 104. And I would encourage any of my neighbors to please speak up if they've done that before. So um, this is an issue and it's an issue that impacts, I think something like 70 households on the other side of the highway. And I would encourage, uh, please, the planning board to please think about the impact that it has on us on the other side of the highway. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I think the next- Mrs. Mrs. Hansen is the only one I think we haven't addressed in the chat. Um, Mrs. Hansen, and then after that um, is uh, Mr. Hunt as well. I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Janet Hansen, 665 Pleasant Street. Um, as you can read, I, I just had a question about, um, they're talking about the businesses that are going to be coming in and um, people always, you know, dangle that, you know, it's going to create jobs, which is fine. It's just people who have to realize it's not just Bridgewater residents that are going to be getting those jobs. So it's not like it's 100% benefit to Bridgewater. But the actual businesses that are coming in, we don't, at this point, as far as we know, are, we don't know what they are. So I was just wondering um, if, to educate me or if what regulations are in place to monitor what businesses will go in there. Will each business that goes in there have to do their own um, approval to make sure that they're um, acceptable businesses there? Um, that's what I you know, wanted to know. And um, it was mentioned by the attorney about that. I forget how he presented it, but I, I just said historic, but there was um, one organization in the Division of Fish and Wildlife stating that there was no issue with those areas. But I was wondering if there's letters um, that can be read to show that they said that and um, specifically. And um, I agree that I was just wondering um, before tonight, if there's a way of, if that building or the site, what they're proposing could be reduced, it could um, perhaps si solve a lot of, uh, you know, some concerns everybody has about the encroachment. The, the proposed thing is like they stretch it to the max of, um, you know, they stretch it to the limit of what is allowed. And sometimes you just gotta back off and you might find you have less um, resistance from people. So that's, I, I just would encourage the thought of that. So um, I guess we'll have to wait and see, but I just wanted to make sure how the businesses going in are, are regulated. Thank you. Mr. Hunt. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, three quick points. Uh, I'm at 8480 Austin Street, Bridgewater, Mass. I'm a resident of the town. I pay taxes in the town. And one of the things I am very interested in is the commercial development of the town. Um, and I see this as a very positive uh, direction. But I would like to ask Mr. Silva and the, and the proprietors to uh, go into Google Earth and actually map the site plan onto Google Earth and put the transparency to about 50% so we can actually visualize where the site is on that higher topography that is next to the lower topography, which is the wetlands you guys have been talking about. I'm having a hard time <clears throat> visualizing exactly where the site plan intersects uh, with 25 and 100 foot and I think that would be very helpful to the CONCOM also. It's just another way to visualize where this goes. That's point uh, two. Uh, I have driven th through that intersection uh, sometimes three times a week on a rush hour, uh, evening rush hour, uh, 4.30 to 5 for five years. Sometimes three times a week and now one time a week. And all of that time, I don't remember traffic backing up in that area more than 10 cars at the light and if that high. So I don't, 
I don't see visually on my experience of five years of data collection in my mind that this is a serious traffic issue out there. Uh, I'm not there in the morning, I admit, but I don't see this in the afternoon as a traffic issue right now. Uh, and third, um, people are very concerned about the NIP, but the NIP is not in its natural state. The NIP is controlled by the West Bridgewater Dam in terms of its elevation. If everyone's concerned about the natural state of the system, that dam needs to be removed. Thank you. Are there any other uh, public comments at this point? If I could just ask um, Mr. Romulus, just while we continue the meeting, if you wouldn't mind putting up sheet four um, from Silver Engineering, that may help Mr. Hunt. Uh, yes, I can do that. Uh, it's a large file, so I'm just going to close it out and open it again. Do you see any other public comment or at this point? I, th I think we've all caught up on the uh, public comments. Yeah. So go ahead, Mr. Silva. Well, I just wanted to respond to, uh, there was a question asked about Raynham. Uh, we, uh, we actually specifically sent a package to uh, the um, North um, Water uh, District office to them so that they would have it not, they wouldn't have to get it from the town that we, we communicated directly with them in order to make sure that they had everything uh, relative to the project. So we did reach out to them specifically. Um, and then the other question was, uh, there was a comment made about uh, these utilities are only benefiting the project. And I just wanted to point out that the, the water line that's in Pleasant Street, the sewer line that's in Pleasant Street, the gas line that's in Pleasant Street are all uh, done by Mr. Mr. Connie. Mr. Connie is the one that has expended money on these things since 2000. So to say that there hasn't been a benefit to the community uh, for these things is not a fair statement. It really isn't. And there was one other comment that was made in one of the letters about um, also saying that Mr. Connie's filled in wetlands and so forth. That has never taken place in all the years that I've been uh, dealing with uh, with the Connie's. The, so that that's just for the record. That that's not a true statement. That's all. So Pat, Pat, to your question, this is Carlton again, 80 Austin Street. Uh, take that schematic and overlay it on Google Earth at a larger perspective. And you'll find that lower area wetlands delineated by the dashed line visualized. And I think that's what we're trying to do. I'm trying to get it as a visual representation of the condition there and where the land will be. And I'm assuming there will be no grading of the property that would actually get even close to where the wetlands are. Uh, but but I, need, I need to see it against the natural background. And the best one I know is Google Earth with that we schematic overlaid we will do that we will do that and actually if you want we can we can post that uh so that it can be looked at in the interim uh, however you want to do it but we will i will make sure that rebecca does that yeah could you make it so because i think that's going to be very helpful for when the concom looks at it okay thank you all right so further discussion from the board tonight do we want to close the public hearing do we want to uh, further I, discuss it do we want to share sure mr Ramos. uh there is one other person mr souza um did say that he would like to make a comment sure a comment. there is somebody with their hand raised as well did you unmute mr souza mr Ramos? uh let's see Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Souza, you are unmuted. Thank you. Frank Souza, 596 Main Street. 
councillor from Precinct 7. Uh, over time, I have spoken with a number of people who live in the area. They are concerned about the increase in traffic to include additional trucks. They see the area as a difficult road to get in and out of their driveways and street. And they think it's only going to get worse as the construction continues. They do not want to see businesses be driven away for that. But in the past, there has been some talk about, I remember during the uh, discussions on the last building, the roadway of putting some turn lanes in. And the discussion went on that that would make it easier because the trucks would be able to get ready to turn and cars and stuff would go around them. And we had some discussion on that tonight and it seems to be pushed aside. And I think we shouldn't wait until five years, three years down the road when this thing is all built out and we have a serious problem and two years before something gets done. I think we really need to look into the potential of trying to fix that area by putting in some turn lanes at least. Maybe a light would never work, but turn lanes should be considered. Um, thank you. And uh, the next uh, comment looks like it's from uh, Ms. Uh, Morrissey. I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. I just have two quick comments. I want to echo my um, neighbor's sentiments about the traffic, of course. And I don't, I think 20, 38 cars is really underestimating the traffic that's kind of part of our um, exiting Lakeside Drive. It's, it's much more. In fact, the study that was done for the new development um, down, down the street off of Lakeside Drive came up with much more car trips per day than, than what's being discussed tonight. Um, and, I, and I know we'll explore that further, but I wanted to also speak about um, my concerns about the drainage. And I'm, I was delighted to hear Mr. Silva say that, that the, respon the responsibility for where the drainage all goes and what gets into the drainage, whether it be um, to keep snow from melting and going into those uh, basins so it doesn't go into the lake and where it all goes. But I want, um, Carlton mentioned something about the West Bridgewater raising or the dam needs to be removed. That may be so, and Mr. Silva brought that up at the last meeting. But I just want to add that in a drought area, the drainage is so critical because the lake has so much, um, it's 400 acres. And so there's a lot of evaporation of that water, in addition to the plant life, uh, which is what the Hockamock Swamp is. And it does a great job of, uh, to prevent flooding in the area. So there's a lot of absor absorption of water. And it's a very shallow lake to begin with. So the, the drainage is very important for those reasons too. And that's all I want to comment on for tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so if is there any more public comment or are we through uh, the list? Like okay. Is there any more board comment or questions? I just, the only thing that I would just like to have reviewed Mr. Antonero would be the, um, the plan that we received today, just the, the fruit street improvement plan and get your recommendations on that. And then, um, ba based on all this, Mr. Romulus, would you suggest we continue and Ms. Burke continue the hearing to our next meeting so we can mull over everything that we've... Um, if you're looking for additional review of the plan, then absolutely you should continue it to your next meeting. Board thoughts? Yeah, well, I th I'm, I'm, I'm not prepared to make any decision tonight. So I would uh, recommend that we either move it to the next meeting or the meeting after. Okay. I'd also ask if they're going to study on may actually maybe get it being able to put a turning lane in for the next meeting also. So, and, and just to, it would be helpful to take some of this feedback tonight yeah, and have the department draft maybe a decision letter with some additional conditions that we could consider as well. Yep. You know, Excuse I, me, Mr. Chairman. Sure, Mr. 
Yeah, I'd just like to remind you that our next meeting, we do have the Broad Street public hearing, which I think will be uh, quite intense. So I'm not sure you want to have these two on the same night. Um, I think uh, my feeling, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, what Mrs. Doris said is correct, that we should put this in the following meeting. Well, do we know if... I mean, what what is the department's thought? I I think I would like to just move it to the next meeting, but Mr. Chairman, uh, from the applicant's point of view, I think we can provide what additional information has been requested and be available for a time slot on the next meeting. It would be it would be very helpful to us to do that, and I think we probably would be able to get through this in you know probably a half hour's worth of time. Uh, if you want to put a time limit on it, but I would like to be on the next agenda to have some opportunity to address these issues. Okay. And we're still somewhat uncertain whether or not Broad Street will be ready to go fully or not, correct? Or, or, or not? I would say we're 98% sure it's ready to go. What, what, is, what, is, what, is the, what is the department's recommendation? Um, I guess I would suggest that um, put it on the next meeting and if the board is not adverse to maybe meeting a half an hour earlier at six o'clock, that might make some sense. Then we could do this at six, give it a half an hour to Attorney Brown's suggestion and then move into Broad Street at 6.30. I'm against that, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Half an hour turns into an hour, hour and a half. We just don't know. I think this should go to the uh, following meeting, period. When is the next conservation meeting for this project? This is for next week, I believe. I believe it's on the 10th, if I recall correctly. Yeah, next Thursday. I concur with uh, Ray in terms of time because If you're trying to squeeze in and rush things. Well, where are we in terms of time to act on the proposal? Um, we're still, and um, a governor has still told all times to act, so we are not under any time constraints. We're still in a state of emergency, so there is no time to act. Any other uh, board feedback or? on it uh, so I mean whatever whatever the majority decides I can run with all right does somebody want to make a motion I mean that's we we have a couple of different opinions so if somebody wants to make a motion we can go with it I'll make a motion that we um, move the public hearing to the first meeting in October Do we have a second? I'll second that. Uh, just for your information, it was October 7th. October 7th. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, may I inquire just a question? Is, is that the next meeting, the second meeting from tonight? The uh, first one in October? Or are there yes. two left in September? There's only one left in September. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'll, I'll, I, I can't do that. Huh? All right, so it's a roll call vote. Mr. Geller? Yes. Mr. McDonald? Yes. Mrs. Greeno? Yes. Mr. Jemian? Yes. Okay, and then I'll vote yes. All right, um, so we're back on October 7th at 6.30, correct? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
the agenda is right here. So do we have, we have minutes that were attached um, to our packet? Has everybody had a chance to read them? And would somebody I, like them? I did not read them. So why don't we, you're our proofreader, Jean, so <laughs> if you haven't read them, can we just move those to the next meeting? Um, okay. Do we have any board or committee comments? No. Do we have a director's report? Uh, not at this time. Okay. So um, we have our next meeting September, is it 16th? Yes. 6.30? Okay. Um, so we're all set then. Yes, do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. By, by Jean. Second by Ray. No. So uh, Ray call vote, ro not a Ray call vote, a roll call vote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Ajemi? Yes. Mrs. Carino? Yes. Mr. McDonald? Yes. Mr. Gallon? Yes. And I'm a yes, so. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night.